Good evening and welcome to the Hedberg Public Library. I'm Jean Yeomans, uh, Adult Services Coordinator. Tonight we are presenting the second in our multi-part series, Piecing the Past Together at Your Library. Last month we learned more about some locations in Janesville in the Where Was That program. Tonight you'll learn about people in Janesville's historic past as we present Who Is That? We are happy to have five knowledgeable people here to tell us more about our city's interesting past. Philip Schauer and Lee Foster, two native sons of Janesville, whose interest in history drew them to joining the Rock County Historical Society first as members and are, who are now serving on the board. Maurice Montgomery, Mr. Janesville History, is a former curator and archivist at the RCHS, is also here. Laurel Fan, the current manager in charge of collections, will also participate, as will Madge Murphy, the executive director of the Rock County Historical Society. Please hold your questions until the end of the program when our speakers will be happy to answer them. Thank you for joining us. Uh, good evening and welcome. I hope that all of you in attendance this evening picked up a sheet on the table over on the side of the room there that has pictures for you all to match up. If you didn't, scurry over and get one, please. Um, no discussion of the area can begin without a brief synopsis of the man for whom the city is named, Henry F. James. He was born in Virginia in 1804, and at the tender age of 21, he headed west. Uh, he had wandered west. I think you'll agree after you hear what I have to say about him. He headed out to Ohio, stayed for a little bit, then, then on to Indiana, where he married and started a family. That's his wife. Uh, he traveled by himself on who knows what kind of roads, uh, mostly Native American footpaths, I think. Made a, a, a journey to the Racine area, uh, forays to, to Fort Howard near Green Bay, and most importantly for us, he made three trips to this area. Uh, finally settling on the future, future corner of Main and Milwaukee st Street in spring of 1836. Uh, that is... Uh, backwards. But anyway, that shows uh, the first wooden bridge uh, at Milwaukee Street. His, his um, cabin would have been located over here near where the Lapin Hayes block is today. Uh, technically, he was a squatter as the land had not been surveyed. Uh, there are some maps on the table that sh show some pretty interesting features of, um, of what Rock County was or wasn't at the time. Um, uh, Rock County at the time, at then, was just a westward extension of Milwaukee County, which was part parcel of Michigan Territory. Uh, from an 18-foot square log cabin he shared with his wife and three children, he established a commercial venture, James Ferry, prospering with, as it grew in the area grew. In 1837, he petitioned the U.S. Postal Department to name this settlement Blackhawk. Unfortunately for him, lucky for us, Iowa lands, really wasn't Iowa, but anyway, the, the lands in that area already had one. So the postmaster general dubbed his settlement Janesville and appointed him postmaster. Uh, it is recorded that the post office consisted of a cigar box attached to a log in the ferry office bar room. Uh, it should be noted at the time that there were other plots vying to become towns in the same vicinity as Janesville. Uh, among them was Wisconsin City, Newburgh, Rockport, we've heard of, uh, Holmes Ferry, which was operated between um, uh, the Big Rock and uh, where the electrical substation is now on the opposite side of the river, kind of towards where the General Motors plant is. Uh, also, St. George's Rapids, which I can't imagine where those are, perhaps below the dam uh, that came to be later. At any rate, they all lost out. James O. flourished. Uh, James was an intrepid adventurer. No matter where he went, he couldn't stay put. He came here, stayed until 
1839, and left 10 years before Wisconsin would even become a state. He traveled the entire breadth of this country from coast to coast, leaving in his wake other cities with his namesake in Iowa, Missouri, and California, from where he writes, and I quote, if any of the Wahoos of Gainesville, who have not had the good or bad fortune to be acquainted with me, desire to know more information, I can inform them that I am now in my 52nd year, weigh 210 pounds, stand six feet two inches in my socks, and have rambled with my family over more western land and to less purpose than any man in it. Now that's not bad for a fellow who headed west from Ohio with an old one-eyed horse, two shirts, and four dollars in cash. <coughs> Our next subject, Henry Traxler was also a pioneer of sorts. As uh, Gainesville's first city manager at the age of 24, he embodied, embodied the budding progressive movement in Wisconsin, which coupled with his training in civil engineering, the concept of urban planning and design by people like John Nolan took root here in the early 1920s. To meet the needs of a burgeoning population, in part fueled by the labor needs of a new General Motors manufacturing plant, he embarked the city on a massive campaign to provide much needed public improvements. He centralized the fire department with modern equipment. And if you see over on the far right over here, the, the, those, those are the last surviving members of, uh, of the old uh, teams that used to to pull the fire equipment around, the, uh, around town, named uh, Charlie and Dick. They look a little apprehensive, but I, I've been assured that they uh, were sent to green pastures rather than the tannery that was just down the street. Uh, he also provided many new programs for public health, the fluorination, of, fluorination treatment of water, immunization, vaccination at well baby cl clinics, which both, I'm sure, greatly reduced the uh, disease and infant mortality rate that ran quite high during those years, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, he's responsible for Riverside Park, uh, expanding what, uh, what then was 95 acres to what we have now uh, at uh, approximately 450 acres. Repro replaced the Monterey and Racine Street bridges with the modern structures that we see today. Uh, provided municipal parking and street lighting and the city's first sewage treatment plant. He accomplished all of this through efficient, fiscally prudent budgets in an era when cronyism, graft, and corruption still flourish, but will, mo will most probably be remembered by development of Goose Island into his namesake that we all know now as Traxler Park. Gainesville High School, 1954 to 1967. Principal and Vice Principal, Ken Vick on the right, Hugh Horswell on the left. The administrative team earned the respect of staff, students, parents, and the community. They were the face of Janesville High School. 1967, Janesville High School splits into Craig and Parker. Ken Bick becomes the principal at Craig. Hugh Horswell goes to Parker. Both men had long tenures in the Janesville school system and an impact on those they came in contact with. Hugh Horswell came to Janesville to teach in 1946. He was a World War II veteran and a graduate of what is now UW-Eau Claire. While in the Janesville system, he taught algebra, history, industrial arts, and coached. He was chosen vice principal in 1954 and held that position until 1967 when he was named principal at the new Parker High School. He held that position until 1979 when he retired from the school system with 34 years of service. Ken Bick was raised in Janesville and graduated from Janesville High School in 1922. Played football basketball and was captain of the basketball team for two years. Went to the University of Wisconsin and graduated in 1927. He was hired by the Milton School District 
in 1928 and served as teacher, coach, and athletic director. One year at Milton and he came to Janesville. He came here to teach science and math and during the summers he served as the playground director for the city of Janesville. 1936 he was named vice principal and 1946 named principal at Janesville High School. Mr. Bick held that position until his retirement at the end of the 1969 school year. 40 plus years in the school system and 23 years as principal. During his years as principal and after retirement, Ken Bick became known as the Janesville Clipper. Each day he would cut articles and announcements from the local papers and send them with personal notes to people he knew for the achievements that they reached. Everyone who passed through the halls at Janesville High School or Craig during his tenure had a memory of Ken Bick, perhaps none better than the long red underwear that he would break out for the big game pep rally. And with that, um, let's take a look at the uh, quiz that you um, had faces in the crowd here. Um, what we gave you is seven pictures uh, and seven sets of clues over on the wall and you were to uh, try and pick out the names uh, and match up the clues to the, to the picture. Um, what we have here in the upper left, uh, I'm sure that you all figured this one out, is George S. Parker. Uh, and in the lower right is Joseph A. Craig. Now, I don't know what the process was or how it came to be decided to name our two high schools after these two individuals. And every, everyone has some idea of their importance to the community. But after reviewing their history and impact on our city, it was surely appropriate for me to see how these two were chose. So they deserve a little bit closer look. Almost every article, clipping, or reference I looked at used the term visionary for Joseph A. Craig. He was born in 1867, raised in Pennsylvania, and set out at the age of 18 to sell farm implements for Milwaukee Harvester. After a short period, he, he switched employers and began as a salesman for the Janesville Machine Company in central Illinois. He switched mostly because he felt it was a better product. He did a good job and at the age of 24 was transferred to the home office. Janesville Machine Company was our largest business at the time. There was a problem of some sort down in Peoria, Illinois. Well, Craig was sent to fix it. The problem got solved and he was asked to return to Janesville. To the surprise of everyone, including Craig, at the age of 30, he was named general manager. He did, a, he did a good job, and he remained at that position until 1918. Now, in his 50s, he became noticed by a man by the name of Mr. William Durant. And this Durant, wanted to hire Craig for his company, General Motors. Craig was needed to head the Samson Tractor Division headquartered in California. Craig had other ideas. He wanted Samson Tractor to locate in Janesville. That is, buy out Janesville Machine Company, build a new factory, and produce the tractors here. Somehow, that happened. Spring of 1919, GM built a new factory. The population in Janesville went from 14,000 to 20,000 in 18 months. Workers came from all over. Janesville was a real boom town. That was until 1922. Our area was hit with a farm depression and sales slowed. New tractors with better designs, 
from, from other companies came to the market, and Samson Tractor was out of business. Craig was quick to see what was going on and realized GM needed to do something with their new factory. Craig wanted GM to produce Fisher truck bodies and Chevrolet trucks. GM told Craig that in order to do that, Janesville must improve schools, housing, roads, bridges, and any other amenity needed to attract and sustain a much larger workforce. Craig and other civic leaders set out to accomplish this task. They didn't have much time, but the community embraced the idea. It was at this time that a decision was made to move from a mayor to a city manager. Craig was a strong supporter. Henry Traxler, as we just learned, was hired as the first city manager. Infrastructure projects were started, a long-range plan developed, and GM started to produce Fisher bodies and Chevrolet trucks. Janesville was able to maintain its manufacturing base and move out of that mini depression. Craig eventually became a vice president with General Motors. Joseph A. Craig was a community leader and he had many outside interests. In 1925, Craig purchased a 60 acre farm on Janesville's west side. It was called Craig Knoll Farm. The house is still located on West Memorial Drive and is known today as Century Elms. One of the, of the Janesville fairgrounds at the time became available for purchase and Craig bought it. That 40 acre site was divided into two parcels. 19 acres was given to a group known as the 4-H, an organization in the county that Craig almost single-handedly created, both the movement and the fairgrounds. He was 4-H president from 29, 1929 to 1937 and remained active with 4-H through the 50s. Purchased the Lovejoy home at 120 Division Street and gifted it to the YWCA for their operations. That's um, uh, Division Street is now uh, Parker Drive. The list goes on and on. He was on the board of directors of the First National Bank, board of directors of Wisconsin Power and Light, board of directors of YMCA, board of directors of YWCA, board of directors of Mercy Hospital. He was a member of the Rotary, the Masons, the Republican Party, the First Congregational Church. In fact, Joseph Craig gave to almost any civic group or cause. He liked to keep it quiet and expected nothing in return. Joseph Craig passed away at the age of 91 in 1958. Likely the most recognized name in Janesville history is George S. Parker. The Parker family came to America in the 1630s. They came from England not long after the Pilgrims of Mayflower and 1620 fame. George Parker was born in Iowa County, Wisconsin in November of 1863 during the Civil War. The family moved to Iowa, then back to Wisconsin. In the mid-1880s, George arrived in Janesville. He had saved $55 for tuition to attend the famous Valentine Telegraph Institute. He would have been here sooner if he could have saved the money. While in school, he became an agent or salesman for the John Holland Pen Company of Cincinnati. These fountain pens were not very good, but neither were the rest of the pens on the market. Parker's fellow students were his best customers. But they all complained about how poorly the pens worked and Parker felt an obligation to, the, to, to try to fix them. After all, the students were all living together. The problem was a steady flow of ink because of the lack of air in the chamber. All manufacturers required, regarded this as a normal difficulty. 
George Parker in his own words. But to me, forced to live with the students I had sold the pens to, it was a very great difficulty indeed. But as the students brought their pens to me to see what could be done, I saw the need of a new sort of feed shaft. I got a scroll saw, a file, and some other simple equipment and tinkered until I had made up a shaft that would let the air up more steadily. I put these shafts into the pens of the manufacturers I was working for, but when I had improved the pens in this way, it occurred to me that I might as well be selling pens of my own. I bought a supply of hard rubber tube, planned some new parts, and with the help of a local jeweler, ordered other parts from manufacturing jobbers, all for the few dollars I could spare. And in my bedroom, in the small hotel where I was living, began assembling my own pens. The next step was to take out a, parent, a patent. I knew nothing about this, but it didn't take me long to learn. When I had scraped up $5, I sent it away to a patent attorney in Washington and eventually got my patent. That was the beginning of Parker Penn. So in 1888, Parker began producing, began production in 1889, received his patent, and incorporated in 1891. The first real success was called the Lucky Curve. The pen and ink feed system were the top of the line. The company grew and moved around from one production site to the other, mostly second floor sites in downtown Janesville. Many improvements were made and Parker held many patents as a result of those improvements. One in particular caught my attention. World War I, an ink to write letters back home was a problem. Parker developed a pen that was self-contained. That is, black pellets were placed in the ink chamber and you simply added water to make ink. Truly an, an innovation in the pen industry. By 1919, land had been purchased and a new factory built in 1920. The factory was located on the corner of East Court and Division now Parker Drive. In 1922, a new line was introduced known as the Duofold. It became the must-have pen. It was also the most expensive pen on the shelf. George Parker remained president from 1891 to 1933 and then held the position as, chamber of, as chairman of the board. At the time, George Parker was the most traveled man in Wisconsin. His world travels allowed him to develop many foreign markets. His pens and Janesville, Wisconsin became known around the world. George Parker, like Joseph Craig, was a community leader. He provided funds for the Women's Club building and the Salvation Army building, served on the Mercy Hospital board, was a member of the Masons, the Rotary, the YMCA, the Elks Club, Red Cross, and served on various governor, governor's boards for the state of Wisconsin. George Parker passed away in 1937. Uh, Don and Jerry Hed Hedberg. If you, didn't, if you didn't get this one, it's, uh, it's on your little sheet. Don graduated from Carthage College of Illinois in 1953 and started to work that same year in the chemistry department at the University of Illinois Chicago. Jerry graduated from UW Stout and was working in Chicago at the same time. They met and were married in 1956. Soon afterwards, Don noticed a need for schools and businesses to be able to purchase science materials and supplies from a reputable source. It was a fragmented market and thus confusing. Don and Jerry started to develop a new way of doing things. 
this new catalog supply company developed into science-related materials. And in 1969, they moved family and business to Janesville. Each partner was vital to this growing enterprise. And in 1977, this kitchen tabletop business became lab safety supply. Growth and expansion followed, and in 1990, lab safety supply moved into a large new facility. The growth continued, and in 1993, the family-owned business was sold to W.W. Granger. The Hedbergs lived for many years just up the street at 221 East Holmes. After the sale of lab safety supply, the Hedberg family established the Hedberg Foundation. This foundation has helped over 100 local, state, and national organizations, and we know is responsible for the expansion of this library. The foundation gifted 4.6 million for that project. We thank the Hedberg family and the foundation once again for their wonderful gift. You may recognize this as a part of the label of your favorite local soda or, or brew. The Gray Beverage Company was founded in 1856. By Joshua Converse Gray with a little help from his brother, William Henry. Of course, we all know Gray's still exists today and is still owned by that same Gray family. What we have here is the obituary. That's all right. There we go. Uh, is the obituary of one Mr. J. C. Gray, Janesville Gazette, April first, eighteen eighty. I found it a bit interesting, and I thought we could look at this a bit closer tonight. It is a typical obituary from the 1880s. Death of an old resident. Mr. J.C. Gray, who has been ill for some time, breathed his last about midnight at his home in the fourth ward. For several days, his, his life has been despaired of, and the event did not come without warning. And yet the blow came with sad heaviness to the friends and relatives. He was widely known, not only in the city, but in the county, having resided here for over 30 years. He came to this city from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and in the early days of Janesville's history, was for a long time landlord of the old stage house, located where the Myers house now is. For years, he had been engaged in the manufacture of soda water, and in connection with his son, has been doing a large business in this line. He won for himself the reputation of being an honest man in his dealings and had a large circle of friends who will regret his death. He had reached the age of 66 years and leaves a wife, two sons, and four daughters. The funeral services are to be held at the house on Locust Street at 2 o'clock next Sunday afternoon. Well, it's not quite the way that we write obituaries today, uh, some 125 years later. This is an example of a obituary that frustrates historians. Let's take just a little closer look. First of all, it has a title, Death of an Old Resident, which makes it look like an article. There's no first name given, so if you didn't know that you were looking for Joshua, you wouldn't necessarily know that that was his obituary. There's no date of birth and no place of birth. There's no date of death, and the, date, and the day of the death can be quite confusing because this same obituary appeared two days in the Gazette. And so when it says that he died about midnight, you don't know whether that was midnight 
or the next day, and then you, when it's printed in the paper, you don't know it again, so it could, be, could have been any one of three days. There's no home address. It just says Locust Street and Fourth Ward. There's no names given for the wife, the sons, or the daughters. There's no name of his current business, but there is reference to the former employer by name. And also, it says funeral services to be held at the house. Most likely in the, in the, in the parlor. This was before funeral parlors, before funeral homes that we would know them as today. It was a common practice to have the service in the home. Many homes were built at this time just to accommodate that ritual. In fact, uh, in, in August, the Rock County Historical Society Tour of Homes will have a very interesting home on the tour uh, to, to show you uh, exactly uh, how the construction was done and the desi design for a home parlor to accommodate the deceased. With that, I'll turn the rest of the quiz over to Phil. Okay. All right, the next person <coughs> that I'm going to talk about is pictured in the lower left corner of your quiz sheet. His name is Jim, James Fitzgerald. Um, he was born in 18, or, <laughs> 1926, and he graduated from uh, Janesville Senior High School. He was an entrepreneur with many business interests. We see him. The, the photo before was that was his uh, uh, yearbook photo in 1944. Uh, in 1948, he founded Fitzgerald Weber Oil, which was a jobber for Shell Oil Company. In the 50s, uh, early 50s, he built Crescent, Crescent Park. Later, Sunnyside, both shopping centers. They were that was a new concept then, totally new concept in shopping then. Uh, Total he, he he started Total TV in the mid 60s. Uh, picture, and went and then went on in um, uh, to sports renown as owner of the Milwaukee Bucks and later Golden State Warriors. Uh, that's a picture of him in the seventies, I believe. Okay, continuing in the sports vein, the next person we have is um, I'm not sure. I think that picture is on your your sheet. His name is Stan Fox. He was a veteran race car driver. He started, at, started out uh, in midget racing, uh, progressing quickly to IndyCar, uh, Indy, IndyCar style racing, uh, driving for the AJ Foyt team from 1987 to 1995. He was in the Brickyard uh, starting lineup eight times. His best finish was eighth. Pretty good for those. Uh, for that group that he was racing against. Uh, unfortunately, in um, 1995, he was involved in a serious crash that uh, limited his abilities as a driver, so he retired. Uh, he, this happened at the Indy 500, but he remained a, 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 a loyal member of the IndyCar family and worked tirelessly to promote safety among fellow drivers and enthusiasts. Uh, next Right. Uh, we about, uh, he's locally significant uh, is the fact that he's the great, great, great grandson of William M. Fallman, who was responsible for, for construction of the Fallman House. I didn't know that. Uh, further, the irony of ironies lies in the fact that uh, Stan Fox was involved in a fatal crash down under south of Auckland while uh, traveling between road rallies in, 2000, in the year 2000. Okay, we got a little hammer up. That's my fault. Um, the next person we're going to talk about is uh, Pauline Jacobus. You see her picture here. Uh, in earlier times, a woman, a woman's role might might mean toil from sunup to sundown to adequately provide for her family. Also, in the late 1800s, uh, this woman experienced. 
an emerging middle class with means, which provided newly found leisure time that could be spent in the pursuit and cultivation of the arts. One hugely popular Victorian pastime uh, of women was China painting. It was this interest that led uh, Tacobus into the newly developing field of art pottery. After study and visits to the established uh, pot Rookwood Pottery in Ohio, she began her endeavors at her home in Chicago in 1883. Uh, a commercial contract for battery cups provided the financial underpinnings for the fledgling endeavor and the opportunity for some wide latitude with both form and design on the art pottery side. In 1888, she re relocated to Edgerton and built a kiln, kiln, as you see here, on the property on the outskirts of town. She attracted local artists and pr produced a wide variety of hand-decorated uh, pieces of intricate floral and geometric designs. The pottery is truly rare and much sought after by collectors. It is marked in a variety of ways. Pauline, impressed Pauline pottery, uh, script Pauline pottery, but also, as you see on the uh, photo, the crown with the opposing peas, uh, I believe it's on your sheet. If you notice, uh, the, the, on the edge of the crown, if you look closely, if you can, if you can envision that. That's not, I'm sorry, it's on the table over there. But anyway, uh, PP, it was a backwards PP. Um, if we went back. Anyway, there were lots of marks. Uh, there we go. If you can see, what I'm trying to say is uh, P, P. So Pauline pottery, um, that's a mark you see on a lot of them. Um, unfortunately, the bulk of her work was unmarked, providing only uh, those familiar with its general characteristics for that roadshow thrill of an undervalued discovery. Uh, if you wish, visit the Henry, Helen Jeffers Woods Museum in familiar side. Familiarize yourself with the extensive collection on permanent display there. Also, you may consider several of, several of the fine re re reference books by local authors available for purchase, two of which are on a side table over on the left here. Okay, now that, uh, that ends the quiz part of this, and I wondered how if, if any response to that, how did anyone do? Anyone get two, three right? None right. Anymore. You got help. Okay. Monty's a, a, a font of knowledge. One wrong. One wrong. Very good. That's very good. Okay, we're switching now, I think. Frances Elizabeth Willard was born in New York in 1839. The family moved to Ohio and then Janesville, where she celebrated her seventh birthday. The family farm was where Cedar Crest Nursing Home is now, and it was called Forest Home. Frances and her younger sister Mary were taught at home by their mother, but Frances didn't think it was fair that her older brother Oliver went to the academy in Janesville while she and Mary had to stay home. Her parents hired a Miss Burdick for a few summers, which appeased Frances for a while. With other children now living nearby, Mr. Willard and his neighbor, Mr. Inman, decided to build a schoolhouse. Frances wrote in her autobiography, it was plain and uninviting, that little bit of a building, standing under the trees on the river bank. No paint has ever brightened it inside or out from that day to the present. It looks like a natural growth, sort of like a big ground nut. Inside, the pine desks were ranged along the wall. Boys were on one side, girls were on the other. A slight platform with a rude desk taking up the end nearest the door. But this schoolhouse was a wonder in our eyes, a temple of learning, a telescope through which we were able to take our first real peep at the world outside of home. Frances attended this school for about 10 months. At 17, she went to the Milwaukee Female College for one semester. The next year, she went to the Evansville College for Women in Evansville, excuse me, Evanston, Illinois, from which she graduated in 1859 as valedictorian of her class. 
She traveled to Europe, came back, and became president of the same college she had just graduated from, the Evansville, Illinois College, I keep saying Evansville, Evanston, Illinois College for Women. Um, she became the first president in 1871. She was 32 years old. This college merged and became Northwestern University in 1873, and Francis um, served as the dean of the women's college for one year. Another merger, this one of the women's movement and the temperance movement, created the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which Francis helped to found. Their declaration of principles are for the protection of the home, the abolition of the liquor traffic, and the triumph of Christ's golden rule in custom and in law. In 1879 and until her death in 1898, she was national president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She continued to support women's suffrage and child labor laws. After her death in eight, at age 58, many honors were given to her. Schools, college dormitories, scholarships, streets, and a memorial church and hospital were named for her. She was the first woman to be honored with a statue in the Statuary Hall of the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. in 1905. She was described as the best loved woman in America. Frances Willard took these words as her motto. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do with the help of God. And I'm going to turn it over to Maurice Montgomery. Oh, oh okay. I was just about, I was just 12 years old, not quite 12 years old in 1947, when the uh, Bataan Memorial that is now at um, uh, the remains of the um, corn exchange uh, was put up in the little circle which now houses the highway uh, department of, uh, department of uh, transportation marker in front of the armory. Uh, there was a big parade, and I seem to remember some bands, although that may, may be part of uh, my imagination. But there were 30 soldiers in their army uniforms who marched west on Milwaukee Street uh, through Janesville and made the turn onto High Street and came down to the corner of High and Dodge. Uh, there was a program in the afternoon, and I cannot tell you one word that was said, but I can tell you that it was very impressive as a 12-year-old boy to stand um, in front of these men about whom I knew nothing other than they were veterans of World War II and watch uh, while um, I believe one of the mothers uh, pulled the cord that let down the drapery around the monument. When <coughs> I returned to Janesville in the 60s, <coughs> little did I know uh, when I went to a barber shop that the barber there was Phil Parrish, who was a, a member of the Bataan Death March and a survivor. Uh, can you go back? Yes. Uh, Phil is the first man here on the left, this person. And in later years, when I worked at the Rock County Historical Society, another member of the Bataan Death March squad surviving <coughs> came to ask me some questions and propose a project that he wanted to do. That was Forrest Knox. And Forrest is the second man from the left. Uh, 
of standing on the tank. They are standing at that intersection of High and Dodge Street in this picture. Unfortunately, um, neither of these men um, wanted to talk about their experiences during World War II. Um, they were both very gentle and very kind. I, I remember Phil Parrish, for instance, the touch of his hand as he trimmed and shaped your hair was just so soft and nice. He himself was very soft-spoken, a wonderful person. They were members of what, was, uh, what later came to be called uh, the Bataan Death March. There were four units in that, um, that made up that group. The group itself was called the 192nd Tank Battalion. Company A was from Janesville, and it included 99 men. Of the 99 men, 33 came back to Janesville after the war. Company B was from Maywood, Illinois. Company C from Port Clinton, Ohio. And Company D from Harrodsburg, Kentucky. <coughs> They were the first of our soldiers to go um, into service at World War II. Um, they left here, I, and I'm speaking particularly about the Janesville group. They left here in November of 1940 and went down to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And from there, <clears throat> down into Louisiana, where they participated in the National Guard uh, maneuvers uh, that were known as the Louisiana maneuvers. Be very careful with that. The last time somebody handed me a cup while I was speaking, I threw it all over the room. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> From Louisiana, they were shipped uh, by train to San Francisco. And at San Francisco, got onto boats where they went to the Philippines. One of the little known facts of the war is that in, uh, we, we all are aware of uh, December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. But the same day, the Japanese also strafed Clark Air Base in the Philippines, which rendered the air support that, the, that uh, these men supposedly were going to depend on for uh, protection from Japanese forces in the Philippines, um, absolutely useless. It was destroyed. It was no more. They, their job was to hold as much as possible and as long as possible the Japanese who had infiltrated the Philippines from uh, materially advancing uh, into all of the Philippines uh, territory. With the destruction of the Clark Air Force uh, base and the planes and uh, the death of some of the soldiers in and there, it became an impossible task. And uh, the group of uh, four companies that totaled 593 men only retreated, retreated, and retreated onto the Bataan Peninsula, where uh, uh, in um, uh, 19, uh, in December and j through January 1942, they were effectively pinned down and uh, forced to surrender to the Japanese. They walked, they trudged, as they said, they trudged many miles back to the forts where uh, they were uh, placed into uh, camps. Uh, many of them were sick. Uh, many of them needed medical attention. And uh, many of them died, obviously. Uh, from the Philippines, they were transported by ship, uh, eventually to uh, some to Corregidor, 
and others to the homeland at Japan where they were again imprisoned and put into um, working conditions if they were able to work. And many of them, uh, as they said after the war, many of them chose to work because they could get out of the camp and they would also get a little better rations. While they were on Bataan and after the attack, December 7th, 1941, they realized that they were indeed a doomed group, that there would be no support coming, there would be no more materiel, there would be no reinforcements. When they heard on their radios President Roosevelt addressing Congress and saying, that some Americans would have to be sacrificed if we were going to win the war. Their sacrifice gave a few months leeway while the United States um, t turned from uh, everyday manufacturing into an all-out war effort. Most of them were liberated between uh, December and February, uh, no, excuse me, December 1944 and February 1945, and returned, uh, returned home. Of the 593 who left, 325 died either in battles or because of deprivation, the march, uh, or in, um, in their imprisoned camp. Thank you, Monty. We all know about Old Abe, the Civil War Eagle, and his place in Wisconsin lore. And just as Sports Illustrated included Secretariat as one of the top athletes of the 20th century, we have chosen to include Miracle. August 20th, 1994, South River Road, Janesville, Wisconsin. On a small farm owned and operated by Valerie and David Heider, where they maintain a small herd of buffalo, an unexpected birth occurs. A white buffalo, not an albino buffalo, but a white buffalo. The first non-albino white buffalo recorded since 1933, and the only known female. That's estimated to be a one in 10 million chance. Miracle, to many of our Native Americans, this birth signified the future filled with hope and excitement. Miracle made headlines all over the world, and then the world came to see her, and they kept coming. During her 10 years of life, she touched many and had an effect on many. To the Sioux, the birth of this white buffalo meant hope and renewal for humanity, harmony between all per people and all races in the world. Let's hope that the Sioux are correct. This evening we've only scratched the surface. The ones that we, the people who we talked about, there's more on each of them. There's more interesting people in this area than what we presented tonight. The list goes on and on. If you liked any aspect of what you've heard tonight, or you have an interest in learning a little bit more about our local history, I want to give you a big tip. The Janesville Room. Right here at the Hedberg Public Library, it's the most underutilized area of the library. Nice big tables, nice thick plush carpet, quiet. You can have the room to yourself most of the time, at least for a while until everyone starts to flock in there after this announcement. <laughs> it's easy. Walk in, grab almost any book, pamphlet, file folder, or directory. Open it up, and you'll find something of interest. Much as quick read, but it's all interesting. It's a, it's a good place. It's a neat place. 
to begin to learn about this community. We have a few thank yous tonight. Uh, we'd like to thank the Hedberg Public Library and Gene Yeomans and Laurel Fant from their staff, uh, JATV and Dwayne Brewer, um, Madge Murphy, uh, not only from the Rock County Historical Society, but tonight uh, she ran our PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the Rock County Historical Society, of course, and their archives department, Ruth Anderson, uh, Dory Copleen, they were both responsible for the photos and the PowerPoint. Um, fellow presenters, Phil Schauer, uh, Laurel Fant again, and of course, Maurice Monty Montgomery. And a special thanks to all of you for attending. I have a couple of announcements to make. The first of which is that our next program is February 20th. It's called what? We've done where and we've done who, and so what is next? What is the what program? Well, it's interesting artifacts and items that, that you may have or that we may have that, are, that, that their use or what they are is unknown. There will be some surprises, I can guarantee you. If anyone has things that they would like to bring, if they're not sure of something, of what something is or what it was used for, they can call and we can help. Doesn't matter if it's large or small, if it's something that we want to use for the program, we'll make sure that it gets here. You can also feel free to bring items on February 20th, but we really would like to have you uh, pre-register those at least a week in advance. Uh, you can call Laurel uh, at the Rock County Historical Society, 756-4509. In conjunction with this piecing the past together, who, what, where, and when, the library, at the library, there's also an exhibit at the Rock County Historical Society titled, Piecing the Past Together, Who, What, Where, and When. <laughs> it's an expanded version of the presented materials at these sessions. Uh, Rock County Historical Society is located at the Helen Jeffers Wood Museum Center, and that exhibit will be open Monday through Fridays, 10 to 5, and is free. 10 to 4. 10 to 4 is free, I guess. Uh, are there any questions on anything tonight? I hope that you enjoyed it, and we hope to see you on February 20th. Thank you.